Good morning, HashiConf. Um, thanks for all coming here. Um, so say you're part of a small team, uh, maybe a couple of people, and you're in charge of managing your company's vault cluster. And you've got hundreds of people across the company all wanting to make use of vault across thousands of systems, many of which are production. And so you expect to get something on the order of maybe a dozen requests a day for changes within Vault. But you're a small team, and you, don't, you manage several things. So you don't have the time to dedicate to just administrating Vault. What are you going to do about that? You don't want to hand out too many admin permissions within Vault, because then you end up with the too many admins problem. And gods know we've been there. <laughs> And let's say for the sake of argument that it's 2017, so vault namespaces haven't been invented yet. Not that you've convinced your finance department to pay for enterprise yet anyway. So how are you going to manage this problem? Well, I'm going to tell you what we did. So my name's Lucy Davenhart. I'm a senior automation engineer at Skybetting and Gaming. I've been there for about three and a half years now, which is about as long as we've been using vault. Now, my team look after several things. But pertinent to this talk, we look after our Vault clusters. We maintain integrations with Vault, we handle some tooling around Vault, and we support all our internal customers using the tool. And we're also the AWS gatekeepers, because we manage access to that via Vault as well. So people that are using Vault, we've got thousands of VMs, hundreds of humans, various scheduled jobs making use of app roles and such and several other things that are difficult to count using AWS and Kubernetes auth. But we're not doing anything particularly complicated with Vault. For the most part, it's static key value secrets and a couple of dynamic things like PKI roles and AWS credentials. So we started using Vault in late 2016, and we had a couple of problems back then that we needed to deal with before we could get it into production. And I'll tell you what those problems were and how we initially addressed those problems and how things improved for us as a result of doing it with Terraform. And as this is a journey that never ends, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that we haven't done yet. So prior to getting Vault into production, a couple of issues we needed to deal with. First of these, we were doing everything manually. Now, I like to think we're pretty good at config management at SBG, but so installing and running Vault it was reasonably well automated. But then configuring it once it was live, yeah, no, we did all that manually. And so doing stuff manually, especially when we're brand new to the product, was naturally going to take a while. But even as we gained experience with the product, certain things just took a long time. And I'm not just talking about the time that it takes to configure Vault. I'm also talking about how long it takes to debug things. So when someone comes to you and says, I don't have access to this secret. Why not? That sort of thing took a while to debug. We've also got making changes to Vault. Uh, because when we're storing our configuration in Vault and nowhere else, it was often time consuming to properly compare to what already existed. So depending on who was making changes, we did things differently. And things were a bit inconsistent. Also, we're just averse to doing things manually. We have the word automation in our job titles, after all. Now, as a side effect of doing this all manually, we had phenomenal cosmic power. There was basically nothing we couldn't do within Vault. Our admin policy back in the day was, let's call it generous and leave it at that. It was scary and not something we wanted when we were at production. There was also audits to consider. So, we use Vault audit logs, and we're shipping them off to Elastic and have been since very early on. And if you're using Vault in production, you absolutely should be using the audit logs. They're pretty great, but you can only answer so many questions with them. For example, you can reasonably easily see when someone has written to a secret. You can see who they are, and you can see when they did it. But you can't see what change they've made, which is a good thing. You don't want secrets appearing in your audit logs. And Vault isn't psychic, so you have no idea what change they've made. And we don't have infinite storage space, so we don't have infinite retention on our audit logs. So anything past the retention period is gone. It's lost to history. So we needed to put something in place to deal with this issue. It didn't have to be perfect. It just had to vaguely work and be good enough for us to get to production. So the first thing we tackled is keeping track of what was changing over time. 
Now, we use Chef, so we write a lot of Ruby. So we wrote a Ruby gem for this. And it would iterate over several paths within Vault, such as policies, LDAP groups, app roles, and it would save them to a Git repository. And we'd run it as part of a scheduled Jenkins job. Specifically, not using this to keep track of secrets over time, because if we're saving those in a Git repository, well, they're not secrets anymore, are they? But we put this together fairly quickly. It's not particularly complicated what it's doing. And as a result, we had the ability to see what was changing over time. This didn't give us any more visibility over who was making changes or why. And we were still having to make changes manually. But it was an improvement. Now, this tool that we made, uh, it was originally intended to be used to make changes back to Vault. But it wasn't very good at that. And I'm allowed to say that because I wrote the thing. It was kind of clunky at that part, and we didn't really have the confidence in it to give it right access to Vault. So that never ended up happening. So instead, to tackle the problem of making changes to Vault, we deployed a tool called Goldfish. And Goldfish was a Vault user interface that existed prior to the open source version of Vault having one. That on its own was useful to us because our users loved user interfaces. But that wasn't the reason we deployed it. The reason was it had a policy request feature. So our users could go into this tool. They could edit policies or add new policies. And obviously, they don't have right access to these things. So those requests would come to us. And assuming they've not asked for something silly, we will approve it. So with those two things in place, um, we had enough to get Vault into production, enough to satisfy our users that we were not going to do anything silly. And it gave us enough time to do things better, figure out how to do things in a better way which is where Terraform comes in. Now, you've come to a talk that is primarily a Vault talk, but it's also a Terraform talk. And just in case there's someone in the audience who doesn't know what Terraform is, it's a tool that allows you to define your resources in a declarative way. And that's typically stuff like your cloud infrastructure, but you can do it for anything with an API. So you write some code to define how you want your resources to look. Terraform keeps track of the state of your resources. And it uses these two things to figure out how to get from where you are now to where you want to be. Now, we've been using it for a while to manage all sorts of things. And we discovered that it has a Vault provider, which means we can use it to configure Vault. But we didn't want to give our users a repository full of raw Terraform code. For a start, that would mean that our users would have to learn how Terraform works at the same time as learning how Vault works. So instead, we wanted something that which resembled the Vault API on disk. And not abstracting stuff like that away means that our users get a chance to learn a little bit more about how Vault works, which is useful when they're requesting multiple interacting resources. And it reduces the learning curve on them, I think. So take this example, these two files. The thing on the left is some minimal Terraform code that you need to put a policy into Vault. And the thing on the right is just that policy. So we don't want our users to have to learn this syntax on the left, when all they actually care about is the thing on the right. There was also going to be a bit of overlap between us configuring things manually or by Goldfish and then doing it with Terraform. So we wanted it to take the output of that Ruby gem we'd written as input. We wanted people to be able to raise pull requests to make changes. So we put it in Bitbucket, and then we can keep track of who's requesting changes, who's approving them, when they were merged, and what Jira tickets they're linked to, all that good stuff. And while we did have dreams of terraforming as much as possible, we were going to start small. So we we're only going to start with policies initially. So back when we started this project, back in May 2018, we had about 300 Vault policies. Uh, today, we have over a 1,000, so quite a few. And finally, we wanted to make sure that if there was anything that was in Vault that wasn't in this repository, we wanted it deleted from Vault. The idea being we shouldn't have any unexpected or unexplained changes within Vault. Now, in theory, in production, this isn't possible anymore. But we don't want to take that risk. And in test, the rules are a bit more relaxed. So it's nice to be able to reset Vault to a known state. So as far as our users are concerned, this looks a bit like this. They go into Bitbucket. They either make their changes directly in the editor, if it's a simple change, or for more complicated changes, clone the repo, make the changes, push it back. 
Either way, they end up with a pull request. And we ask our users to get those pull requests approved within their team before they send them to us, which often picks up little issues before they get to us. And it also gives us some assurance that people are asking for things that they're supposed to have access to. And it also gives Jenkins enough time to approve the pull request as well. So once this has happened, they come to us, they come to one of our Slack channels and say, hey, I have this pull request uh, for Vault. Can you approve it, please? And they interact with a Slack bot that we use throughout the company that handles this for us. It creates a Slack thread. It keeps track of these requests in that thread and keeps track of it in a JIRA ticket so we can keep track of it later. And it notifies whoever's on duty that day. Funnily enough, in this example, it's me. So I come along, I take a look at that pull request. Now, assuming it's good, I'll approve it and I'll merge it. And then I'll tell them, Terraform's doing its thing, it should be live soon. Shortly after that, we get another notification from Jenkins in a Slack channel. It tells us it's come up with a plan. It wants to make some changes to Vault. It'll give me a brief summary of what those changes are, as well as a link that I can click to view the entire plan. And then I can compare that to what the pull request said and make sure it's doing what it's supposed to. It also gives me a Vault CLI command, so I don't have to think what command I need to run. And I run that command, and that gives Jenkins right access to Vault. So I take the output of that command, I paste it back into Jenkins, and it goes away and makes those changes. And that bit's really quick. And so I go back and tell the user, all your stuff is live, go and enjoy your secrets. Now, depending on how familiar they are with this process, I will be more or less verbose. If this is their first pull request, I will explain a lot, I'll give them helpful tips, I'll tell them if they need to re-authenticate with Vault, for example. This particular user's done it hundreds of times before, so they get emojis. So what's going on in the background here? So we use Jenkins for this, uh, and you could theoretically use any other CI, CD tool if you wanted. I believe Circle and Harness are here this week, so I recommend one of those. But there's not actually that much logic in the Jenkins job itself. Each of these stages corresponds to a target within a make file. We have make on all our laptops, so we should be able to run this whole thing locally. So if I run make help, we can see all those stages again. And being able to run this whole thing locally means that I can test new changes to it, test any new features I want to add to it. So the first of these stages in it, this is where we make sure we have access to our Terraform state, where Terraform is keeping track of our resources. We keep our Terraform state remotely in Amazon S3, so naturally we need to get some AWS credentials out of Vault for that. We do Terraform in it, so that'll download any other Terraform dependencies that we need. And we make use of Terraform workspaces, which means we can maintain separate Terraform states for each of our Vault clusters. Next, we have the import phase. Now, this is our fail secure mechanism. This is where we make sure that there's nothing in Vault that shouldn't be there. So for each of our resources that we have in this pipeline, we have a script that lists all the resources of that type within Vault. It lists all the resources of that type in the Terraform state, i.e. everything that Terraform knows about. And it'll compare those two things. And if there's something in Vault that Terraform doesn't already know about, we import it into the Terraform state. We tell Terraform that it exists. And the idea being that if you tell Terraform something exists, but you haven't written the code to say that it's supposed to exist, then what Terraform will want to do is it will want to delete that, which is the whole point of this stage of the job. Next, we actually write some Terraform code. So we have the generate phase. In the case of policies, this will iterate through all our policy files. It will use the file name as the name of the policy, and it will generate the necessary Terraform code for these. And then all the resources are similar to this. We save that to a Terraform file that we can then use within Terraform later. We do a bit of validation. So a lot of the validation is actually done during the generate phase just because it's easier to write it that way. So some resource-specific checks are done there. And we also do Terraform validate, which makes sure that we've not come up with the gibberish. We make sure that we've actually written some Terraform code. Now, if you're a Terraform Enterprise user, you could do all sorts of fancy Sentinel policy stuff here. And then at this point, we have a Terraform state which corresponds to everything that we know about within Vault. We have a bunch of generated Terraform code which corresponds to everything that we want to be within Vault. So if we run Terraform plan, it will compare those two things and figure out if it needs to make any changes. And it will save that 
to a plan file. And the idea being that when we tell Terraform to make those changes later, it's not going to try anything unexpected, and it doesn't have to think about it. So applying it will actually be super quick. Now, if we're validating a pull request, that's all we need to do at this point. We can mark it as successful, and that will contribute to the pull request being able to be merged. So thus far, this entire job has been running with read-only access to the bits of Vault that it looks after. And we're fairly confident in allowing it to do this without human supervision, because the things that it manages, we don't consider to be secrets. We're talking LDAP groups, and policies, and app roles, and that sort of thing. So also, it's Terraform states that it's been potentially writing to. We can regenerate that entire thing from scratch using the steps in the import stage. We don't want to, because it'll take a while, but it's theoretically doable. So at this point, it'll prompt us to grant it write access. And it gives us this vault CLI command. This is part of an app role that has read and write access to vault. And running this command will give me a secret ID, which is single use and available for like only 30 seconds. And it's prefixed with PSCLI, which is our perplexingly snazzy command line interface, which is another tool my team looks after, which is an entire talk in itself. But all you need to know is it makes sure that everyone across the company is using the same version of the Vault CLI. Uh, whenever we're interacting with any repos full of Terraform code, we're all using the same version of Terraform for that repository. And it handles all our Vault off automatically. So we give Jenkins that secret ID, and it goes ahead and applies those changes. It uses that um, plan file that it generated earlier. And this is so quick that in the time it's taken me to explain it, it could have done it 10 times over because it's not had to think about anything. Now, finally, we do a little bit of cleanup in our repo. Uh, so we take all that generated Terraform code that we've um, generated, and we commit that back to the repository. Now, we don't really need it to do this. We don't tend to refer to it all that often, but it's nice to have it around uh, permanently in case we need to refer to it later. And we also merge release, which is our branch where we keep track of things that we want to be live into master, where, where we keep track of things that are live. A nice thing in the Git repository to keep track of the fact that there has been a release. So that was our minimal viable product. It was solving part of the problem for us. And so we started adding more to it. We started adding additional resources. And we did something interesting for each of those resources, I think. Starting with LDAP groups, so what policies do individual groups of humans have access to within Vault? Now, this is where we had to get a little bit creative. Uh, so we added these to the pipeline back in July 2018, and there were about 90 of these at the time. There's about 250 now. But back then, there wasn't actually a dedicated resource for managing these in the Terraform provider. Fortunately, though, there was a resource called Vault Generic Secret, and this allows you to manage arbitrary paths within Vault as a Terraform resource, which is very powerful. You can do all sorts with that. But it's also very dangerous if you're not being careful. You can expose your secrets in places you don't want them exposed. So if you do ever use this for anything, pay attention to the warnings in the documentation. So we were being careful but we were also using it to manage things we didn't consider to be secrets. So we're using LDAP groups and what policies they're mapped to. So we weren't too worried, but still, later on, when they released the uh, dedicated resource for managing these things, we switched over to using that instead. Now, because our users weren't writing raw Terraform code, this was completely invisible to our users. They didn't have to do anything different for this. Also, with LDAP groups, uh, there was a change that happened recently at our place uh, where there are now certain types of LDAP groups that aren't allowed to be mapped to permissions within systems such as Vault. And that confused the heck out of a lot of our users for a while. And so we ended up getting pull requests for the wrong kind of LDAP group. But fortunately, it's very easy to detect. And because it's very easy to detect, we now have something in our pipeline so that if our user tries to request that sort of thing, we can mark their pull request as failed and give them an explanation as to why. So we don't have to explain it to them before that pull request comes to us. Next thing we added is app roles. Uh, so this is our second most common authentication mechanism for Vault. Uh, we had about 160 of these when we added it to the pipeline back in September 2018. Since then, that number has almost doubled. 
Now, the majority of these are used by us to give Jenkins jobs access to Vault. And so they should all be configured fairly similarly. But again, depending on who was implementing these things, because it took a while to compare these things, depending on who was doing it, things looked a little bit different, usually around the IP addresses uh, that we have for the Jenkins agents. And so when we added this to the pipeline, we documented for our users and recommended they start using Terraform variables for that sort of thing. And so that means that whenever the team that manages those Jenkins agents wants to add any new ones, it's just one file they need to update, and then that will update hundreds of app roles in one go. And it also means that when we're looking in this repository, we don't have a, we don't have a list of IP addresses that we need to figure out what it means. We have a human-readable variable name. Next thing we added is Kubernetes auth, um, which is a pretty cool authentication mechanism for Vault. And the team that manages our Kubernetes clusters came to us and said, hey, we want to use Kates as an auth mechanism for Vault. And we said, fine, that sounds fantastic, with two problems, that being that we don't know how Kates works and we don't manage it. So we told them that they were free to add it to this pipeline if they wanted to. And because of the way we had designed this, they didn't have to do that much work. All they needed to do was add an import script to keep track of what was already in Vault and a generate script to write the Terraform code. And that didn't take that much work to do, and it didn't take us hardly any time at all to approve that. I love it when our users go away and add features like this for us. It's great when that happens. We've got AWS auth as well. I mean, we added reasonably recently, some point this year. Now, we use Vault to manage access to AWS. This is the other way around, using AWS to manage access to Vault. And I'm not going to go into the details, but for each of our 100 plus AWS accounts, before we even get to mapping roles to policies, et cetera, there's something that we need to configure in Vault for each and every single one of those accounts. Unfortunately, it's the same thing for every account, and all we need to know is the account number. So now the pipeline has a step which will list all of the accounts in our organization, get the account numbers, and generate these resources. So that means that whenever we add any new AWS accounts, this is something that we don't have to think about. It just happens automatically. And finally, the last thing we added to the pipeline is Active Directory users. So again, prompted by the fact that we had this LDAP restructure, we now had many more of these and people wanting to manage the passwords with Vault. And this is another case where we had to get creative because there isn't a dedicated resource for managing these. And so you might think that we just did the same thing as we did for LDAP groups. But we can't do that in this case because these things are, these things are tricky. So there are certain parameters when you're writing these things in Vault that you either don't know what they are or they change so frequently that if you were to use generic secret, then Terraform would end up in a loop, attempting to try to write the same thing to Vault over and over again. Fortunately, there's a much better resource now, a much more flexible resource called Generic Endpoint. And it basically does the same thing. You can use it to manage arbitrary Vault endpoints. But it has a parameter, and if you specify that, then it will only, the Terraform only cares if the keys that you have specified are correct. So in this case, as long as the account name is fine, we don't care when the password was last set. Terraform is happy. As far as Terraform is concerned, it's unchanged. And so it won't get stuck in a loop. So how has this improved things for us? Now, the big obvious improvement first is time. Individual changes like this to Vault now take up less of our time because our users are doing the bulk of the work. And that means that we're able to accept more of their requests. We've got more visibility of what's going on within Vault. So we can see all these pull requests going in and the Jenkins jobs notifications. And it also means that our users are able to debug their own access with a combination of this repo and an internal wiki page. And that, again, means we have more time. They are able to figure stuff out and potentially raise pull requests to fix their own issues. And we're also able to answer some more of the audit questions, the who, what, when, how, and why of historical vault setup. So if our auditors come to us and say, 
this sneaky user here, what access did they have in Vault on this particular date? As long as we can find out what LDAP groups they were in, that is a question that we can now answer. We can now search through this repository and look for patterns, look for things we can make more efficient and potentially find issues before they become problems. And as a result of doing all this automation, there's now certain things that individual humans just simply cannot do within Vault, which is a lot less scary. A lot less scary than having that phenomenal cosmic power we had before. Now, what does the future hold for us? Now, I can't tell you exactly because priorities are constantly shifting, and I left my crystal ball in the hotel room. So, I can tell you some ideas that we have, things that we could add to this. And the first of these is we could do more with it. We could add more resources to it. There are lots of things you can do with Vault and lots of things that we are doing with Vault that we're not terraforming yet. For example, PKI roles. We have quite a few of these, but our users haven't actually asked for any new ones in the best part of half a year. Our users are fairly happy reusing the ones that they already have. And so we've deprioritized terraforming that. The Sentinel policies, we have Vault Enterprise, so we can make use of these. And they are significantly more powerful than the standard ACL policies that you may be familiar with. But for the most part, our users don't need them. And we haven't got many people that are using these. But as and when our users discover them and want to make use of them, then it will naturally fit into the pipeline. They are very similar to configure to regular policies. And Vault namespaces. This is a really cool enterprise feature. It basically gives you a vault within a vault, a dedicated section of vault that certain people could administrate. And when we set these up, there are certain other resources we need to configure around them, and they need to be consistent and correct with each other, which sounds like the sort of job that Terraform would do really well. We can do a lot more around auto-generation. So for our 100 plus AWS accounts, they're all configured very similarly. So just by telling me the name of the account, as far as Vault is concerned, I can theoretically tell you now what policies should exist, what LDAP groups they should be mapped to, and potentially what app roles they're mapped to as well. Because we're, very, we're trying to be very consistent with that. And if we're being consistent, if I can tell you that by the name alone, I can write a script to tell you that as well. In fact, I have, it's just not live yet. The next point, it's in the future section of my talk, but the team that manages our Kubernetes clusters, they're fantastic, and in the past few weeks, they have been experimenting with this sort of thing already. They have a thing where whenever they need to grant people access to bits of Kates, uh, they have a template pull request that they get their users to raise with us. Well, a template pull request, that sounds like the sort of thing you can automate. And so they're experimenting with that, and it looks to be working really well. There's also some service discovery stuff that we could be doing. So back to app roles, and using Jenkins as the example. If the team that manages those uh, Jenkins agents starts adding lots of these or starts scaling up and down every couple of days, then they don't want to have to raise a pull request every time they do that. So we could pull that list of IP addresses out of, say, console. Now, if they were doing it several times a day, several times an hour, perhaps, then perhaps we want to use a different authentication mechanism. We've also got security to consider. So we're fairly happy with the trade-off we have at the moment between security and convenience. But if we ever needed to, we could lean more on the security side of things. There are some additional safeguards we could add. For example, Vault supports two-factor authentication. We could have something in place where before one of my team is able to grant Jenkins right access to Vault, we could require a two-factor auth prompt. And that's really easy to add um, in the policies for this. There's also control groups, which is a really cool enterprise feature that has been on my list of shiny cool features to play with list for a while. And it's the sort of thing where if we wanted to require more than one person approve these changes to Vault, it's the sort of feature we could use for that. And there's a lot more validation we could be doing. So we don't really do that much at the moment. We have a couple of resource-specific checks. And we have Terraform Validate, which makes sure that we've actually generated some Terraform code. But there's loads more we could be doing here. 
And the main reason we haven't is sort of the things that people get wrong when they're raising these pull requests don't happen often enough to be worth our time to write checks for these things. Now, I'm not just talking the time that it would take for us to write these checks. I'm talking about also the time that it would take to run these checks. A recent example is with LDAP groups. A couple of people were raising requests for groups, and they got the case sensitivity not quite right. And so a naive check for that um, would check against all the LDAP groups and make sure they're correct. And that took about three and a half minutes, which is not that long. But considering the fact that the entire job takes three and a half minutes, yeah, probably not really worth it. Again, this is, if you have uh, Terraform Enterprise, this is the sort of place where you could have a lot of Sentinel policies as well to make sure people are requesting the right sort of things. Now, three and a half minutes isn't that long, but as we grow, that number is gonna get longer. It's gonna take longer to manage things. And there are a couple of inefficiencies in this pipeline that I'm aware of that we can make faster. And I have ideas for how we can do that. So that's something I'm gonna have to tackle reasonably soonish. And also back to namespaces. So we could make this job generic, which is a common pattern across the company. We have generic Jenkins jobs that run against arbitrary Git repositories. So when we set up namespaces, the admins of those namespaces are gonna be in a similar position to where we were a couple of years ago. And they might be happy writing their own automation, but if they don't wanna do that, if they don't wanna spend the time doing that, they could reuse our job and have their own Git repository that runs with this job. And then it'll just work for them. So Terraform is really great at managing Vault. But should you go away and try to emulate what we've done here? Honestly, probably not. Um, and I'm not saying that because I think what we've done is bad. I wouldn't be on this stage if I thought that. What we've done works really well for us, but it was based on initial experimentation and incremental improvements over the course of a couple of years. And it was based on some limitations that existed that don't exist now. But hopefully, Hopefully, I've given you some insight into how we've tackled this problem, and maybe some inspiration to try something like this yourselves. So thank you all for watching. You have been a fantastic audience. If you want to ask me anything later, or just get some of my stickers, you can find me on Twitter or on the Hashicomp Slack. Thank you all. You've been great.